You ready to hear the word of the Lord? We're going to do it by faith. Here we go. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. We're in the middle of a series entitled Holy Moments. And my subtitle this year is Don't Miss Them. Holy Moments, Don't Miss Them. In Luke chapter eight, uh, 2, verse 8, it says, And there, was, there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby and keeping watch over their flocks at night. I want, to, I want you to notice a couple of things. I want you to, first of all, notice that being a shepherd was not just an occupation, but it was a lifestyle. Being a Christian is not something you add to your identity. Being a Christian is your identity. It is a very lifestyle, okay? That this was not something that they checked in and out on. They actually lived in the fields with their sheep, and they were keeping watch over them. And I want you to notice the other thing. They were keeping watch over them by night. See, at nighttime was when the predators came out. Okay, that's when your wolves come out. That's when your coyotes come out. That's when, that's when you know, you, you have your nighttime predators. And can I tell you that it's in your nighttime season that you need to be most aware and most awake and most alert. We have a tendency of sleeping at night. And I, I get that. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for your blessed sleep. But can I also tell you that at nighttime, when, if you're in a dark season in your life, you need to be vigilant because that's when the predators come out. And um, it, it says that they were out there living in the fields, watching their sheep, being responsible with the mundane things in life, and it was nighttime. And it says that an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord has shone around them, and they were afraid. Because we're fallen nature, uh, and, and, and we're fallen creatures, because we, we all are flawed, Anytime we come into the tangible presence of God, there will be an element of fear that will come upon you. I, I can tell you from personal experience, and many of you have had similar experiences, there have been times when the tangible presence of God was so thick in the room that there was a, your, your, your body would begin to react. There was two times in my, my life where I was in revival services where the power of God was so great, I literally had to run off the platform out the side door because I lost my stomach. I, I, I just lost everything in my stomach. It, it was that tangible. I've, I've seen the presence of God so tangible in sanctuary before where, and, and one of those was that service, where people literally would fall in fetal positions out of their chairs into the aisles under conviction of the power of God. And their loved ones would pick them up and carry them to the altar. I've seen that. I've, I've seen what the presence of God, we, we take it so flippantly, and I think it's because we really don't understand the magnitude of, uh, of, uh, of what is available for us if, if, uh, if we would hunger and thirst and understand the value of God's presence. But there is a terror that comes. You don't flippantly come uh, into the presence of God. There is a holy fear. And it, it's hard to describe because you're both afraid and yet you don't, wanna, you don't want it to stop. There, there, there's such life in it. There's such joy in it. I don't know if Nick can help me with the back screen or not, but that would be awesome. If not, I'd understand. Okay. Um, but... Uh, there, there, there's just a, a tangible presence that you, 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 you want more, and yet you, you feel like you're more alive and you feel like you're going to die at the same time. It's, it's, it's just a crazy experience because we live in this, this thing called flesh. And it says that, that, that the angels came and the glory of God filled the, the fields all around them and fear came over them. And the angel said this, the angel said to them, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I don't know where you are in your spiritual journey, if you're listening to me by podcast, watching by live stream, or here today. Can I tell you, God is not something to be afraid of. God loves us, cares for us. He, he, he wants only good for us. The enemy would have us to think that he's angry and mean and just, you know, demanding and, and cruel, and, but that, that's not true. He said, listen, don't be afraid. 
I've got good news of great joy, and it's available to everyone. He says, I've got good news of great joy that it will be for all the people. It is available to you today. And he said, today in the, day, in the town of, of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. And he said, this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. I want you to notice something. Again, church, finish the statement for me. Read the Bible and ask a lot of I want you to notice this morning, you will find. You have to participate in this thing called life and journey Christianity. He said, I'm gonna give you a message, but you're gonna have to carry it out. It's not enough to come to church on Sunday morning and be challenged or hear something that, you know, feels good and then go and don't do anything about it. You have to participate. So, I'm, 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 so the news was there's the Savior being born, but it's going to do you no good unless you go find it. You've got to participate. You've got to follow through. A lot of people, they know about the Christmas story, but they don't apply it to their life, and their lives are not changed. It says that they went and they found a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in the manger, and suddenly a great company of Heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. I just had a revelation. Oh my Lord, have mercy. It starts with one angel who made an announcement. They followed through on the announcement. They went and found Jesus and all of a sudden they're surrounded by a host of angels. If you want more, you've got to be obedient to what you already know. And as you do that, you will grow in glory. He will take you from glory to glory to glory. The heavenly host didn't even come until after they found him. It says, glory to God in the highest and peace to earth, uh, to men of whom his favor rests. Not upon everyone, but those who will enter into that rest, embrace it, and that rest comes upon him. And it says, and when the angels left and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem. So much for my revelation I just shared with you because they hadn't gone yet. But anyway, let us go. It's good stuff anyway. <laughs> let us go to Bethlehem and see the things that had happened which the Lord had told us about. And so they hurried off. Church, when you know that you gotta do something, don't put it off. Don't put it off. When you know that God has told you to do something, to put it off will, will increase the odds that you will never follow through. They immediately, they went and they hurried and they did what the angel told them to do. And they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning all that had been told them about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. I want you to notice again, they didn't go tell the good news until they first experienced the good news. We can only share what we have experienced. People don't need our head knowledge. They don't need that. They need someone who has a relationship with the Lord, someone who has tasted and seen, and then don't keep it to yourself, but be sure to create a holy moment for somebody else and tell of the good news of what you've experienced. Can somebody say amen? amen? I want you to notice the reaction of all the people, though. They were all amazed at what the shepherd said to them. There's a difference between being amazed and being changed. There's a difference between being amazed and embracing the message and being led into a salvation experience. The people were amazed, but I propose to you they were not changed. And it goes on to say, but Mary, she responded differently. 
Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen, which were just as they had been told. Just two or three quick points this morning. I don't know if he can put a clock up there, but that would help me too, if, if it's possible. Um, and the first one is this. Holy moments occur at the most inopportune times. You know, we, we talk about how disaster strikes when it's most inopportune. Can I tell you holy moments also strike at the most inopportune time? I don't know if you've thought about it, but wouldn't it have been a whole lot better if instead of the angel coming to Mary who was a virgin and, and to be married, you know, to Joseph, engaged to be married, and, and telling her first, and then get putting her through the torment of trying to convince her fiance that she was pure and faithful to him and that this thing that had never happened to any other woman in her life happened to her. I mean, think about the awkwardness of it, right? And then the angel having to come separately to Joseph and convince him that what Mary told him would be true, you know, which then put him in an awkward position too, because now, you know, everybody's, everybody does the math. I mean, they, they go, okay, wait a minute. They got married here and the baby was born here, right? I mean, that put them in a really awkward position. See, wouldn't it have been a whole lot better if instead of doing it that way, been more opportunistic, if, if, if the angel visited them both at the same time, right after the wedding, <laughs> before the consummation. I'm like, that sounds like a whole lot better plan, right? God doesn't work that way. It doesn't, sometimes, it doesn't, you know, that would have been so much easier, right? I, I mean, it, there would have been no convincing one another. I, I, I mean, just, if I could be God, I'd mess everything up. But, but can I tell you that, that you need to be always sensitive to what's happening around you, always sensitive to the Holy Spirit, Always praying with every encounter. Since I've been doing this series, I, 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 I've, I've been noticing how many people, even as I'm walking, I could be, I had this happen several times this week. I'm walking in, into a store, customer will be coming out of the store. We will literally walk from me to the table to each other, and they never even give me eye contact. And I'm going, wow, how many, how many people do we walk by and never even acknowledge their existence besides being sensitive to the Holy Spirit saying, is this someone that you would like for me to just say a kind word to right now? Is this someone that you would like for me to engage with right now? Because I will tell you, it often comes at the most inopportune time. Can somebody say amen? In fact, can I remind you that Jesus even said that the Son of Man will come in an hour when you do not expect it. We need to be always sensitive to the Holy Spirit. But this is the main point that I want to drive home today, and that's this. Holy moments often come through unimpressive messengers. I can't tell you how many times Holy Spirit has used somebody that really was not that impressive to me, and they spoke a word, and I mean, it pierced my heart, and I went, oh my God. I've had sinners bring conviction to me through conversations. But holy moments often comes. In fact, in, in, in this story, we, we understand that all who heard the shepherd's report were amazed. But it does not say that they were led to believe. Why? Because shepherds were not impressive. Shepherds were not very high in the social scale. Shepherds were not taken seriously very often. And so even though they had this encounter... 
okay? And they, and they came in with this excitement upon them. It, it, the people were amazed because they could tell something was different about these shepherds, but it did not move them to do anything about it. How do I know that? Everything's not recorded in scripture, but I want you to remember what's taking place. Why is everybody in Bethlehem? Taxes, right? How many of you are excited about April 15th in the United States? I mean, it's not an exciting moment, okay? This, everybody, it, it, it's, it's a very depressing moment. It's a very crowded moment. Remember, there's a crowd. Mary and Joseph couldn't even find an inn to stay in. They could not find a relative that would open their home to them. They have to have the baby in a manger because there's so many people. And the, and, and the shepherds come into this environment with the message of the greatest holy moment known to man, the birth of our Savior. But they are preconceived with their own personal needs. Let's get this over with. Let's get our taxes in the mail. Let's put that stamp on there. Write that painful check. Let's get this thing over with. Let's get some food, and let's get back home as quick as we can. In other words, when you see the manger scene, why isn't it crowded? The crowd was there. All they had to do was walk across the street. But we don't see a crowd at the manger scene at all. Which tells me, oh, that's amazing. Great story. Hurry, let's get home. It didn't change their life. And church, we have to be careful because many times we can miss a holy moment because of the messenger in which it comes through. And by the way, if you feel like you are not qualified to be that messenger, <laughs> The very fact that you don't feel that way proves that you are a great messenger. Can I remind you what Paul tells us? Paul says this about us. He said, listen, brothers, think about yourself, who you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise. <laughs> Just look at your neighbor. <laughs> Not many of you were wise. Oh, let's not forget the next phrase, though by human standards. Because the wisest thing you can do is embrace Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord. Amen? I mean, that's the best decision I ever made. Even better than marrying my wife, okay? That was a pretty good one. But not many of you were wise back then according to the world standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose. Hello, God chose me, God chose you. God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. He chose the weak, weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are. Why? So that no one could boast before him, right? And it was because of him, say that, because of him that you are in Christ Jesus. It's not, be, in fact, I, I, it's, it's interesting because when you are in the stage that I'm in right now, you ask a lot of questions and you go, why do we say this, you know? You know, we say, I, I, I accepted Jesus as my savior or I made Jesus as my savior. I'm not sure that's even good terminology because you're still in control of this thing. <laughs> no, 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 no. He made himself real to me, and I humbly embraced who he already was. He is the king of the world, whether I believe it or not, whether I acknowledge it or not. He is king of kings and lord of lords. And he, it was because of him that I now know Christ Jesus. Before, uh, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is our righteousness holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip forward just a little bit. They missed 
the most holy moment because the messengers of the messengers who are, uh, announced Jesus' arrival. They didn't take the shepherds, I propose to you, very seriously. And can I tell you, we are flawed. Christians are flawed. Preachers are flawed. And when we mess up, we often give others the license to turn away from the gospel message. We have to watch our lives continuously. Amen? We cannot afford, I remind myself, I cannot afford to have a bad attitude at Hollywood Market. I cannot afford to have inappropriate behavior at Lifetime Fitness Center. I, 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 can't, I can't afford that. Because it doesn't matter how good I am, even as a pastor, if I, in a moment, become overcome by emotions that are not healthy, and I give myself to them, and I say or behave in a way that is inappropriate, to that person, I am not Christian. To that person, I am actually preventing them from coming to know the Jesus that I want them to come to know. Not only that, but I'm preventing them from embracing your testimony as well. Right? How many times have you been wanting to witness to somebody and they love and admire you, but the moment you start witnessing, they just start grouping you in with everybody else and go, oh no, hypocrites, a bunch of hypocrites. Right? Christians are a bunch of hypocrites, right? You know, just tell them, hey, just come join us. You're one too. <laughs> but, but may we never give them the reason. May we never give them a reason. And by the way, if you're searching, that reason will not hold up in court. You cannot blame your not embracing Jesus as your Savior on somebody else's behavior. I'm just warning you right now. You're going to give account for yourself. But, but they, were, they almost missed, or they did miss, the most holy moment because of the messenger. And I just want to warn us this morning that if we're not careful, we are in danger of making the same mistake. What are you talking about, Pastor? Here's what I'm talking about. Almost every week, I keep telling you how important this book is right here. Do you realize only 20% of Americans read this book three times a week at all? The authors of this book, the authors of this book, there's about 40 authors that God used in this book. And the authors of this book, they got a divine revelation. We only get a book. The shepherds were deeply impacted by the message. Why? Angels come talk to you. You're going to listen to. The shepherds were deeply impacted. The people were not. Why? Because they received the message through a shepherd, not through an angel. And church, I want to point out to you that in this book right here, this is not just a book. It can appear to be. This is not just a book. This is God's holy word. And you and I have the privilege and the invitation at any moment that we want to, to open it up. And if we want to, we can have a holy moment, any moment of any day. And yet, how often does it sit on the shelf untouched? We have to be careful, church, not to allow the enemy to rob from us the importance of the Word of God. It's easy to not hear the Word of God and receive a holy moment because it comes through seemingly ordinary means. 
But this is a holy book. By the way, as I was studying this week, I looked it up. Do you know who the number one producer is of the Word of God? It's not the United States. It's China. Ironic. They will not let their people live by it, but they'll make money off of it. And just because we own one of these or say that we believe it, it doesn't change your life until you truly let it encounter you. China produces more Bibles than any other country in the world and yet will not let its people submit to it openly. Selah. So they missed out because of the messenger. But I want to point out that Mary looked beyond the messenger and embraced the message. It said that Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. Church, can I just remind us once again and emphasize once again that we, have to, we must believe in people if we want them to believe. We must value people if we want them to feel valued. We must treasure people if we want them to feel treasured. Jesus believes in you and we have, to, we have to genuinely believe in people. I skipped over James that talks about not having favoritism. And as I was reading that passage this week, Holy Spirit was convicting me. Because can I tell you, even in this room, there are some of you that I am more concerned about your favor than other people. But before you start throwing stones at me, I think that if you evaluate your life, you can do that too. There are certain people that I walk into the room and for some reason I want to impress them or I want them favor. And there's other people that I can almost, maybe could even use the word snub. I don't really, uh, they don't have a whole lot to add to my life. They don't have a whole lot to offer. And I'll be kind, but whether, if, they're, if they think much of me, I don't really care. And can I tell you, that's wrong. And I'll never reach that person until I genuinely care about that person. We're, we miss holy moments because we lack value sometimes for people. But, but Mary treasured. She, she valued. We need to treasure people and we need to treasure the Word of God. She treasured the message. She put value on it. And then she pondered it. She, she chewed on it. She meditated on it. She considered it valuable. Kind of reminds me of Psalms 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. I treasure your law. And I ponder, I meditate upon it all day long. I treasure your law. This week I was reading another book by one of my favorite authors, Tim, uh, Tim Keller. He's now with the Lord. He just recently went with the Lord to be with the Lord. Amazing author, amazing man of God. Just one of the great theologians of our, of our time. Our, we, 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 our, the church will miss Tim. But I was reading Tim, uh, one of Tim Keller's books, and he told a, a story of a, uh, something he experienced a couple of decades ago, a few decades ago, early in his ministry. He went to a, a Bible conference, and they were, they, it, was com it was a conference focused on learning how to read the Bible and study the Bible. And he was in this one session. And the teacher of the session uh, uh, took the session to actually do an illustrated um, exercise. And, and she said, she gave them one verse of scripture. It was just a short verse of scripture. 
And she said, I want you to take out your journal and I want you to take the next 30 minutes, 30 minutes, and I want you to meditate on this verse of scripture for 30 minutes. And I want you to write 30 different insights from this one verse. And Tim said that, that uh, he pulled out his notepad and, in, and within 10 minutes he had, he had written everything he could think of. And uh, he had put his pen down and was just gonna, you know, just kind of daydream for the next 20 minutes. And he looked around the room and he saw everybody still engaged and so he felt a little convicted. And so he, he went back and he just kept on and as he was continued to press point past that point of initial revelation, he said, all of a sudden, the Lord started showing him some more things, and he started writing them down and writing them down. When the 30 minutes was up, the instructor said, now I want you to look over your list, and I want you to circle the most important life-changing insight that you just got from this verse. So they all circled it. She said, now I want to ask you this. How many of you, that life-impacting insight you got within the first five minutes. Let me see your hands. No hands. She said, okay, how many of you received your life, that, that, that insight 10 minutes in? No hands. She said, okay, how about, how many, it was after 15 minutes and just a couple of hands went up. She said, after 20 minutes, a couple of more hands went up. She said, how about after 25 minutes? He said, the rest of the hands went up. Church, we got to learn how to meditate upon God's word. Don't be in a hurry to get it done. And okay, okay, God, we talked and on your way, chew on it. God wants to speak to you. God wants to give you a revelation, not only for yourself, but for somebody that you can share it with that day. I, I, I see that all the time. And so in closing, I just want to ask us a couple of questions. How would my life be different if I really believe the Bible? I mean, to the point where I, 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 I don't forget <laughs> to actually spend time like I... I mean, we don't, I'm looking around, there's not too many of us forget to eat. <laughs> really believe the Bible. How would it change my thinking? How would it change my feelings? How would, it, how would it change my actions? How would it change the relationships around me? How would it change my prayer life and my attitude toward God? Let me ask an even more probing question, and that's this. If I was to genuinely care about and believe in every person that I encountered, how would that change my interaction with them? I'm embarrassed. I don't know how it happened, but I know during the sabbatical, the Lord revealed to me how much I had changed over 40 years of ministry. I've, I've often said recently, I, I, I consider myself an introvert. I don't think that's a true statement. Because when I look back at the early stages of my ministry, I was not an introvert at all. I was an extrovert. I mean, I would talk to anybody and everybody, and 90 plus percent of the time, we would talk about Jesus somewhere in that conversation in a non-condemning way. Just, I couldn't help it. I just spilled out. And I look at my life over the last several years and I'm going, what happened to me? I'm just talking about me, guys. What happened to me? And I think God wants to soften that heart once again. I think he wants to restore that first love once again. I think he wants to restore my love in people, genuinely love people once again. If the church would genuinely love people, what kind of difference could we make? What kind of holy moments could we experience every moment of every day? How would it change the impact that we make upon their lives? And so I want to ask all of us to ask this question of Holy Spirit. 
And that is, who needs me to create a holy moment for them? And how can I do it this week? Who in my life right now really needs me to create a holy moment for them? And how can I do that? How can I partner with Holy Spirit? And don't underestimate your power to make a difference. I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do it real quick because I have no clue what time it is. So just recently, I quit Lifetime. And um, the gym up the, up the street here, um, been a part of it for years. It just got too expensive. And uh, so I, 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 I turned in my notification. I said, I, I, I'm not paying this. I'm not paying this. And I, so I started saying goodbye to my friends at the gym. I have, I have about six guys that I have developed a relationship with. And, and so three weeks ago, I told them, I said, listen, I canceled my lifetime. I'm only gonna be here for three more weeks. And, um, uh, and they all began to, oh no, no, don't do that, don't do that. In fact, one guy, his name's Mark. Uh, <laughs> he's my greatest evangelist at the gym. He tells everybody who I am, even though I try not to tell him. But anyway, he's the preacher down the street. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but Mark is a, Mark is a great guy. He got a great heart. I suspect he was raised Catholic. And, uh, <laughs> I told him I was quitting a couple of weeks ago and he said, no, 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 no. He said, why, why? I said, but it's just too expensive. He said, he said, I'll pay, I'll pay your tuition. I'll pay it. I just want you to stay here. I'll pay it. And, uh, I said, no, Mark. I said, I, it's not that I can't afford it. It's just, I can't justify it. I would rather give that money to missions and um, and he starts, amen, hallelujah, F-bomb, F-bomb. Yeah, that's right. We need to take care of the F-bomb, F-bomb. It was, it was hilarious, man. It was awesome. And uh, I'm just, I'm just, I'm laughing inside like you just did, you know. I'm going, I'm so glad that even though he knows who I am, he's still comfortable around me, you know. And uh, it, it's just great. So, uh, so I started visiting some different gyms. And every one of the gyms, I'm going in and I'm getting depressed. I mean, I'm depressed the moment I step in the gym. And and because uh, they just don't have all the, the luxuries. I'm a baby, okay? I need some baby in. I, I, I guess. And, and they just don't have it. And so I'm, I'm getting depressed. And, 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 and I even signed up for one of them and was planning on and signed up for a couple of them because I signed up for two of them and still save a lot of money. But anyway. And finally, after some of my friends kept harping on me and so forth, I realized that I was just being cheap on me again. And that I think God wants me to stay at Lifetime as my mission field for my friends. And so, um, so I, I told him last week, the day I signed up, I said, hey, I'm staying. And Mark, Mark starts hallelujah and F-bombing at the same time. <laughs> and he said, I'll pay the difference. I said, no, Mark, you're not going to pay the difference. But the point that I'm making is this. You really are making a difference even when you don't know you're making a difference. As youth pastor, I learned never look at their face. Never, <laughs> never look at their face. You teenagers are, never look at their face. Because there's a whole lot more going on than what they're going to let you know. Mom and dad, chill. They're okay, okay? Never look at their face. I don't look at your faces. Okay, you think I do. I'm looking over your head, so I don't want to see what you're saying to me. No. Don't look at their faces. There's always more going on. Who, though, needs you this week? Who needs you to create a holy moment for them? And how are you going to do that? So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I, I just ask that you would use us as vessels of honor.